The European Union consists of four main bodies. The European Commission functions as a cabinet, with 26 commissioners acting as ministers, and the Commission President, who is appointed by consensus of all EU heads of government, acting as a First Minister. The Commission promises legislation, implements policy and the budget, manages foreign relations, and enforces EU laws. The European Council is made up of the President and all EU heads of government. The European Parliament is elected, with nations receiving representation roughly proportionate to their population. Parties with similar ideologies tend to work together. We meet four times annually. Legislation and the EU budget, which is approximately 1% of total European Union GNP, requires the approval of both the Council of Ministers and the European Council. The Committee of Permanent Representatives is made up of Member States' European Union Ambassadors and meets weekly to coordinate the Council of Ministers. For a sub-council to approve legislation, the legislation must be approved by 55% of Member States representing 65% of the EU population and at least four objecting nations are needed to block legislation. Some issues, such as taxation and defence, require unanimous approval. Before 2014, approval required a majority of states representing at least 62% of the EU population and 72.3% of council votes. The Parliament only has an advisory role on matters of security and foreign relations. At present, there are 28 member states, which currently includes the United Kingdom. To apply for membership to the European Council, applicants must be a stable democracy with observation of the rule of law, human rights and respect for minority groups. They must have a market economy which is healthy enough to function within the EU and have the capacity to implement and follow all EU laws and policies. These criteria were established in Copenhagen in 1993 and are known as the Copenhagen Criteria. Applications are considered by the European Commission, who handles negotiations. Negotiations take a number of years, as Member States must adopt and enforce all EU laws before admission is granted. Comparatively with many other regions in the world, Member countries of the European Union can be held as largely accountable for the rise of greenhouse gases and climate change issues now facing the world. This is largely due to their extensive role in the Industrial Revolution of the late 18th to early 19th centuries, which is cited by numerous climate change researchers as the origin of human impact on climate and global warming issues. The boom in factory work and production, which originated in Britain circa 1760, was adapted throughout Europe as industry continued to increase and thrive. The result of this huge rise in manufacturing led, understandably, to an increase in the level of production spurred greenhouse gases pouring into our atmosphere and started the level of industry which continues the role of human impact today. The effect of human impact since the Industrial Revolution has been studied and recorded extensively. In comparison with pre-revolution levels, the amount of CO2 and other greenhouse gases had almost doubled by 2007, with the 280 parts per million recorded previously skyrocketing to 430 parts per million in modern times. In fact, within just the past decade, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere have risen by approximately 30 parts per million, where before human impact it took 1,000 years for this same amount of increase to occur. Worryingly, this is a level that has not been reached for more than a million years. In the past, the European Union had been largely reticent about greenhouse gas emissions and climate change and, effectively, our role within this. With countries especially focused on industry, such as Germany and the UK, the output of excessive CO2 was common. In fact, climate change did not become a focus on Europe's political agenda until the 1990s, when the European Commission attempted to set up a common European carbon tax. This immediately met contention from industry, wherein a number of member states wanted to maintain exclusive sovereignty over the area. Resultantly, political momentum on the matter decreased substantially. Historically in the EU, greenhouse gas emissions resulted from two sets of opposing factors, those increasing the greenhouse gas emissions and those mitigating them. Greenhouse gas emissions in Europe have increased over the last 20 years substantially due to the burning of fossil fuels. This has been primarily used for generation of electricity and heat by thermal plants, transport with an increasing share of road transport compared with other modes, industry given the economic growth in manufacturing industries and households whose number is affected by demographic changes observed over the last decades. 
will recommend the adoption of this protocol to the conference by unanimity. Eventually, the role of the 1997 Kyoto Protocol spurred the Union's motivation to show progress in greenhouse gas output by 2005, as the scheme required. As such, the European Union has been extremely proactive in our response to greenhouse gas emissions and attitude towards climate change globally. With our role in many global schemes aimed to mitigate climate change, along with our European Union emissions trading system, currently the largest emissions trading system in the world, the EU is now committed to reversing any past harm caused by our actions and creating a better, cleaner future for our world. As a very large stakeholder group that spans across a great range of land, we will feel the effects of climate change in many ways, one of which is the problems associated with rising temperatures. Firstly, high temperatures have serious consequences for human health, including the potential increase in the cases of temperature-related mortality. Mortality is shown to rise in hot weather, especially in elderly people, and it is very likely that climate change will result in increases in the frequency of heat waves. It also imposes a risk on biodiversity and on the distribution and abundance of many plant and animal species which are already showing problems in adapting to climate change. This will furthermore affect many social and economic sectors such as agriculture, tourism and energy production. Climate change is also likely to affect the ecosystem goods and services that we rely on for human health. Not only this, but warmer temperatures also increase the risk of desertification in southern parts of Europe and cause a greater risk of droughts. Droughts may have wide-ranging effects on health, including on nutrition, infectious diseases and on forest fires, causing air pollution, particularly in low-income countries. Global warming also has a major effect on the predictability of events such as natural disasters. Over the past three decades, common disasters in Europe, such as river floods and major storms, have resulted in not only fatalities, but also direct economic losses, which affected millions of people. It is predicted that with global warming, warmer temperatures will result in more frequent and intense heavy rainstorms. Intense and high rates of precipitation flowing into river systems will increase the frequency of flash flooding, especially in downstream valleys and mountainous areas. Finally, the sea level rise predicted to occur will greaten the already present risk of flooding and land erosion in coastal areas, which will be a threat to low-lying coastal populations. According to the Basque Centre for Climate Change, the average global sea level has risen over 20 centimetres. This will be specifically alarming to coastal cities including Athens, Naples, Barcelona, Istanbul, Dublin and more. The rise is also predicted to reduce the amount of available fresh water due to seawater pushing further into underground water tables. This increase in frequency lowers the predictability of these disasters occurring and thus our response capacity. We also face the major risk of worsened spreading of diseases due to climate change, and this is a major risk to human health. The transmission of many infectious disease agents may be sensitive to weather conditions, therefore changes in temperature and rainfall may affect the distribution of disease vectors such as malaria, dengue and diarrheal diseases. Such health effects will need to be controlled by factors such as economic development and the successful implementation of adaption methods. We have also predicted there to be a greater issue with water shortages. Our fresh water originates mostly from mountainous areas, with 40% of Europe's water sourced from the Alpine region. Thus, changes in the snow and glacier dynamics, along with changes in precipitation patterns, may lead to water shortages across Europe. Not only is this a problem of clean drinking water, but the shortages will have a negative impact on hydroelectric power, this being the primary energy source for large areas of Europe and will affect other critical EU sectors including agriculture, tourism, industry, energy and transport. To discuss our contribution to climate change policies and action, we begin in 2006. The EU committed to reducing global warming emissions by at least 20% of 1990 levels by 2020, to producing 20% of our energy from renewable sources by 2020, and to reduce primary energy use by 20% through increased energy efficiency schemes. 
we have budgeted $375 billion a year to cut greenhouse gas emissions by at least 80% by 2050 compared to 1990 levels, and we will meet these goals through binding national commitments. These vary depending on the unique situation of a given country, but will average out to the overall targets. We acknowledge that all countries are in a unique situation and thus each will be limited in their abilities to respond to climate change. We have therefore made important commitments to international climate finance to help our more developing countries transition to low carbon energy sources, reduce tropical deforestation and adapt to climate change. For example, this includes Norway's commitment of $1 billion to compensate Brazil for its emissions reductions. But these differences in abilities of nations lie also within the European Union community itself. Geographical features are a major factor creating distinct separations between the situations of each country. Austria, for example, is a completely landlocked country, a large proportion of which is covered by the Alps, to the extent that 40% of the country lies 1,000 metres above sea level. Many of their programmes, such as the 2007 Climate Strategy and the 2011 Climate Change Act, are made in accordance to the European Emissions Trading Scheme and overall EU policies. The measures are taken are aimed to increase energy efficiency in households, building construction and developing renewable energy sources. A large focus is on hydropower. In the Alpine region, river water levels are predicted to increase in winter and decrease in summer due to factors such as rainfall, precipitation and evaporation exacerbated by climate change. Austria is an economically sound country in the EU and is proactive in developing programs to increase the use of hydroelectric power production to counteract the effects of climate change. In similar retrospect, Germany has been undergoing an Energiewende, or energy turning point, for the past last few years. As of last year, 29.5% of, en of Germany's energy comes from renewables. About a third of this is from wind energy, a third from waste and biomass, a fifth from solar energy and a tenth from hydroelectricity. There was a 23.8% drop in greenhouse gas emissions between 1990 and 2013, and the government aims for a 40% reduction by 2020. Unfortunately, the current trajectory will only result in a 33% reduction in this time frame. Ultimately, Germany has made much progress around climate action and still has much to do to achieve its environmental goals. Finland can be compared in their abilities and desires to take action against climate change, with their aims to be promoters of renewable energy, with a long-term goal of reducing emissions by 80% by 2050. They aim to be a low-carbon society in the near future, with a national energy and climate strategy implemented to meet the EU's targets for battling climate change by 2020, a key feature in the strategy being to limit the country's dependence on oil. The Finnish government is currently promoting sustainable living, eating and transport, and pollution, specifically of water and air, has significantly decreased in recent years as a result of governmental policies. However, we acknowledge that more work needs to be done, and this is indicated by the failure to meet deadlines protecting biodiversity of species posed by the EU. Some Finnish emissions have also not decreased sufficiently, in spite of new technologies for fuel and industry processes being implemented. Greece contrasts drastically to these countries and illustrates our flexibility and support of all nations in respect to climate change action. Climate change will mostly affect Greece in terms of rising temperatures, drought risk and changing patterns and lower levels of precipitation. The majority of the Greek landscape is coastal with an extensive coastline and approximately 25% lowland. Climate change will not only affect Greece environmentally, but economically, as two of Greece's most important economic sources, tourism and agriculture, will be affected. As temperatures rise and precipitation levels by 15% in winter alone, agricultural patterns will be thrown off, the chance of forest fires will increase and humidity will become largely unbearable, especially in coastal and urbanised areas, such as tourists visit. Most of these effects are estimated to begin taking place between 2021 and 2050, in response, Greece's climate change program plans are set out in the National Climate Change Program, which heavily emphasises achieving GHG emissions reductions. It aims to do this by changing the fuel mix to include a higher percentage of natural gas and renewable energy sources, improving energy efficiency and conservation in all sectors, 
affecting structural changes in agriculture and transportation, and reducing emissions in waste management and expanding research and development efforts. Greece also participates in the EU ETS. As a country recently afflicted with worrying economic conditions, Greece has had to take help from the EU in the implementation of their climate change policies. The EU's ETS compensation mechanisms are designed to assist developing countries in the Union to apply mitigation policies available to countries with a GDP per capita below 60% of the EU average as Greece has fallen to. Although originally Greece was unable to be included in such an initiative despite its low GDP, provisions have been provided to subsidise the country's mitigation efforts. Such a provision was approved in March of this year, wherein 300 million euros were approved by the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, or EBRD, to fund Greece's current renewable energy projects. Since Greece is heavily dependent on imported fossil fuels, there are aims to invest and finance the country's huge potential for renewables, including solar, wind, biomass and geothermal power. Spain is in a similar situation to Greece, and their situations can thus be compared. In 2008, Spain exceeded the CO2 emissions allowed by the Kyoto Protocol by more than 20%. Then the global financial crisis hit, production fell, and as a result, energy demand and CO2 emissions also lowered greatly. Statistics show that the stagnation of the construction industry in Spain, resulting from the widespread economic crisis, is one of the key factors that contributed to Spain's lowering emissions. 27% of total emissions were accounted for by energy use as of 2013, with a 28% increase in the emissions of this sector between 1990 and 2011. Transport emissions, which are the second highest source of emissions in Spain, have risen by more than 50% since 1990. This is reflective of the increased number of houses, improved standard of living and growing floor area of commercial premises. The use of solar energy and buildings with improved insulation could not outweigh these rising emissions. In reference to our involvement in international climate change policy, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, was adopted in 1992. The Kyoto Protocol is an international agreement that was established at the Third Conference of the Parties in 1997. This protocol obliges approximately 40 developed countries to limit or reduce GHG emissions. It recognises that developed countries are principally responsible for the current high levels of GHG emissions in the atmosphere and that it is a result of more than 150 years of industrial activity. The protocol places a heavier burden on developed nations under the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and countries must meet these targets primarily through national measures. We see the Kyoto Protocol as an important first step towards a truly global emissions reduction regime that will stabilise GHG emissions and can provide the architecture for the future international agreement on climate change. Further investigating the effects of the Kyoto Protocol can provide policy implications for global warming issues and contribute to the research studies on sustainable development. So far, we have been very successful in achieving our climate change goals. Since 1990, the European Union has successfully cut our greenhouse gas emissions by 18%. Not only this, but we are making it economically viable as well to be climate change friendly. In the first commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol from 2008 to 2012, 15 European Union member states have overachieved their joint reduction. Their commitment called for an annual 8% reduction below base year levels, which is generally 1990, and the average reduction was actually 12.2%. As for the second Kyoto commitment period, which began in 2013 and is currently still running until 2020, the European Union has committed to achieve an average 20% reduction below base year levels over the period and intends to fulfil its commitment jointly with Iceland. It is also important to note the economic benefits to our climate change policy, between 1990 and 2011, the European Union GDP grew by 45%. Our European Commissioner for Climate Change, Connie Hedegaard, has previously discussed that the EU is currently delivering on its Kyoto commitments. The EU has reduced its emissions significantly since 1990 while expanding its economy. This further demonstrates that climate policy can be implemented in a way that fosters jobs and growth. Our 20% reduction target for 2020 is also within reach thanks to our climate and energy legislation. And through additional policies, we're actually on track to overachieve our target. 
In reaction to the establishment of the Kyoto Protocol, we as the European Union decided to implement several strategies to ensure we met the standards and expectations of the protocol and we developed the European Union's Emissions Trading Scheme. This scheme was the first of its kind in the world and ensures not only that we meet the standards of the Kyoto Protocol, but it is also seen as the best economic solution. Although inspired by the Kyoto Protocol, it exists independently from it. The Kyoto Protocol exists as a flagship measure by which the member states of the European Union will be meeting their obligations in both the protocol and the emissions trading scheme during the first commitment period between 2008 to 2012. The emissions trading scheme was enacted before the Kyoto Protocol became legally binding in reference to both European Union and international law. However, the emissions trading scheme would have still become operational even if the Kyoto Protocol had not successfully begun in February of 2005. This is an excellent illustration in our determined commitment as a stakeholder to fight climate change both internationally and on an individual level. This is further highlighted with the facts that the first trial or trading period from 2005 through 2007 was undertaken with no relationship with the Kyoto Protocol and was successful. It was also used as a means of ensuring that the European Union would not disappoint the protocol between 2008 and 2012. Finally, the trading scheme's successes have ensured that this will continue beyond the conclusion of the Kyoto Protocol. Basically, the emissions trading scheme means that companies are set a limit as to how much of each pollutant type they can produce. If a country wishes to produce more, they are required to buy it from another country, which in turn creates an overall reduction within the Union itself. The European Union is proud that we have established the world's first cap-and-trade program for carbon dioxide emissions. There were two phases of establishment and design of the emissions trading scheme. In January of 2005, a widely agreed upon and transparent price for the trading of carbon dioxide emissions was decided upon. This is a single price and is very beneficial to creating an efficient market. This decision was followed by the previously mentioned trial, which successfully occurred before the Kyoto Protocol was put in place. The primary goal for the first phase was to develop infrastructure and provide an experience that would enable the trading scheme to successfully limit their emissions to correspond to the first commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol between 2008 and 2012. When implementing the trading scheme, a multinational system was imagined that would provide useful future perspectives on potential global problems that may arise in the future development of a global greenhouse gas emissions trading system. We are proud to be leaders and developers for climate change action. Overall, the emissions trading scheme is a classic cap and trade system. However, it is also significantly different from those used elsewhere. For example, it can be compared to other cap and trade systems previously implemented in the United States for other emissions. It is a unique system in that we have implemented an absolute quantity limit on carbon dioxide emissions, which have been placed on some 12,000 emitting facilities located in the European Union. We have also distributed tradable allowances to these facilities in amount equal to the cap and the accountability measures of our system result in these facilities being required to measure and report their carbon dioxide emissions all to a common standard. Most recently, the Paris Agreement has been a major indicator of our climate change policy beliefs and action. We as the EU have been at the forefront of international efforts towards a global climate deal. Following limited participation in the Kyoto Protocol, and the lack of agreement in Copenhagen in 2009, we have been building a broad coalition of developed and developing countries in favour of high ambition that shaped the successful outcome of the Paris Conference. An internationally binding agreement was made within countries with several goals. Primarily, we established a long-term goal of keeping the increase in global average temperature to well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. It was also agreed that we would aim to limit the increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius, since this would significantly reduce the risks and impacts associated with climate change. This was to be undertaken rapidly with the best available science, though it was recognised that the changes involved would take longer for some developing countries. It was also decided that governments would meet every five years to set more ambitious targets as required by science, report to each other and the public on how well they are doing with implementing their targets, and that we would track progress towards our long-term goals through a robust transparency and accountability system. Our enthusiasm and support for this meant that we became the first major economy to submit our intended contribution to the new agreement in March 2015. We are already taking steps to implement our target to reduce emissions by at least 40% by 2030. Conclusively, 
We as the European Union acknowledge our long historical role in the production of greenhouse gas emissions and accept responsibility for the role we have played in contributing to climate change and its effects. However, we have now adopted policies to help mitigate the effects of these emissions. We have taken action against climate change both within our stakeholder group and internationally, and we encourage all other stakeholders to unite in a common effort to combat climate change.